Hello and welcome to Endor Model Railway. I'm Jonathan. In my last video I showed the electrics detailed planet that I did for Endor's point motors, point frogs and route indication LEDs. In this video I'll talk about how I implemented it and what tools and components I found useful. My first conundrum was how to secure the LEDs in place. Everything on Endor is above board so I wouldn't be making any holes for them. I got lucky. With the wires bent 90 degrees, the LEDs could rest flat on the board and came up just the right height. Cutting bits of 3mm trackbed cork to fit around them held them in place. I had some 1mm cork that I cut into thin strips to cover the tops of the wires. Using my plan, I could see where point motors and wires would need to go, and in general, I worked from right to left along the area that has the sidings. For each section I worked on, I completed the three elements, rods, frog wires and LED wires, before moving further left. I put point rods in place first, with their associated points just placed loose at this stage. I knew from my plan how long they'd need to be. The rods are piano wire that I got from a model shop website, either Antics Online or Hatton's. It's 0.8mm diameter. I bought brass tube that's got a 1.2mm outer diameter and a 1mm inner diameter so the piano wire fits without room to flex about, but not too tightly either. To start with, I tried cutting the brass tube with a Dremel, but that didn't work very well with the equipment that I've got, and I found it easier to use wire cutters. This approach does crush the end of the tube shut, but I found I could squash the ends open again using gentle pressure from some pliers, and then forcing some piano wire through by hand. I then bent the piano wire as necessary, ready for connection to a point motor, in the way I talked about in video number 4. With the piano wire prepared and in the brass tube, I stuck the brass tube down using electrical insulation tape. It seems to have reasonably good grip whilst also being easy to peel off again if necessary. I had a mix of electrofrog and unifrog points. For the electrofrog ones, I soldered a wire to the underside of the frog rail. I didn't want solder joins or wire to be visible on the outside of the track. The wires will, of course, be above board so they're routed just beneath the track through channels in the cork. I won't say much about soldering at this stage, there are lots of videos around about that, but there are two main things that really helped me to move from totally inept to just about competent. Using a bit of flux paste and cleaning my soldering iron. With the point rod in place and the frog wire attached, I could draw pencil lines around the points and the frog wire and then cut appropriate shapes of cork to leave gaps or channels for them. Similarly for the LEDs, I placed them where I'd like them to go near the ends of the points, making sure they came up between sleepers, and then draw around them on the board. I then cut appropriate shapes of cork to fit around them and hold them in place. As with the point rods, I taped the LED wires down, but I also put glue over them where they went into the track bed and covered them with cork strips. Overall, I think it would have been a lot easier if all I'd had to do was drill a hole down through the cork, so this is an area where having everything above board makes things more fiddly. For the point frogs and for the LEDs, I used 702 wire. It's quite thin, so it helps to save space on the board. I'm hoping this will make it easier to hide when I start the scenic phase. There's only one place throughout the sequence of points where I've introduced a track power cable to the stock rails. In this case, I soldered wire to the underside of a track joiner, making space for the cable in the same way as for the point frogs. Mostly, the stock rails connected to the black side of the track power circuit rely on the track joiners to get power which saved space, where I already had a lot of cables routed through channels in the cork and over the baseboard. Again, if I were routing cables straight down through holes in the boards, I might have put more track power connections in, but I don't think they're necessary anyway. My opinions and experience of track power dropper cable frequency can be a detailed topic for a further video. I'm no longer scared of soldering wires to things, but I do find it a faff. Everything I do with Endor happens at the dining table in an open plan section of the family home, which creates two constraints. I feel it's too dangerous to have the soldering iron on when the children are up and about, and I have to get all of the necessary equipment out for each session on the railway and put it away again afterwards. I spent quite a long time looking at different cable connection options. Where possible, I want to be able to disconnect and reconnect cables without needing to desolder and resolder in case I need to do fault finding or change something in the future. I decided that where I had soldered connections to wires, I wanted those wires to go a short distance to some kind of non-soldered connection. This was most important for the wires to the relays. Railway Scenics supply each of these relays with a base that they push into, so that if the relay breaks, you can just swap it out for a new one, and to prevent you from damaging the relay from the heat of soldering. 
The connections on these are tiny and feel fragile, so I didn't want long cable runs from them. I fear enough movement from the cable might tear the connector. To solder cables to them, I bent the connectors 90 degrees and held the thing in a small vise. They were able to take the weight of very short cable runs. To secure them to the board, I found a screw size just right to go down through the gap in the middle. There are a few options that I've tried for connecting cables. Fundamentally, there are only a handful of type of connectors, but they come in various sizes and from various brands. To start with, I went with these reasonably compact spring clip connectors. They're pretty good for putting together temporary experiments, but overall they take up a reasonable amount of space and they've got nothing about them for fastening them to the board. Potentially some sticky backed velcro would be one non-permanent way to connect them, but I didn't think of that until very recently. Part of their space inefficiency isn't necessarily their actual dimensions, but all of the cables have to come in from the same side, so it can cause inefficient cable routing. Instead, I chose to use what I think are very standard terminal block connectors with screws. Cables can connect at opposite sides, or multiple cables can come into one side of a connector, and you can get up to 12 terminals in one strip, so they're fairly compact. It's often difficult to get precise dimensions for these things online, but I found from buying a few that ones rated at 3 amps are physically the smallest. I don't expect any of my cables to be carrying a current as high as 3 amps, so those are the ones that I've bought the most of. They're easy to screw into the board too. They're actually also the most compact method I've seen for non-permanently connecting two cables, as I've done here. I was happy with the terminal connectors and, where I had to, with soldering, but it turned out using 702 cables brought unexpected issues. I bought some automatic cable strippers, but I was finding that it often snapped one or two of the wires, so it wasn't any good for me. I went for this other type. There seemed to be lots of almost identical options available. I suspect a lot of them are just rebrands of exactly the same thing, so I just plumped for one. This still has the propensity to damage the wires, but it does at least have this adjuster that, with a bit of trial and error, can be set to work with the 702 wires. I still have some trouble with them damaging the cable sleeve where it shouldn't, but I found that was because the cable was slipping through the gripper that's supposed to hold it still, so I tightly pinned the cable here with my thumb and then all is well. I found it easier to use both types of stripper on the 1602 cables. To stop wires getting frayed, they need some kind of ferrule on the end which is true of any multi-strand cable, but I needed super tiny ones. I'd bought packs of ferrules and found that they were all too big. Eventually I found that 0.5mm diameter bootlace ferrules from Railway Scenics were small enough. I've ended up using literally hundreds of them. But getting small enough ferrules wasn't the only issue. I haven't been able to find any crimping tools that squash them tight enough. I've tried two different types of crimpers. There are these flat ones, which seem pretty common, and this more sophisticated one that wraps around the whole ferrule. What I did in the end was crush them using pliers. This was very easy to do, so I did the same for my 1602 bus wires with slightly bigger bootlace ferrules, which are 0.75mm diameter. This works well if the cables aren't going to be moved much, but over time I found that for the cables that go into the back of my controller and point lever stand, neither of which are fixed to the railway, the strands in the wire get fatigued from movement and snap off. For these connections, I think I need something that comes over the cable casing and is crimped on there, but I've yet to experiment with that. These findings lead me to my third top tip. Use at least 1602 cables where possible. They're easier to work with overall. Where I needed lots of cables to connect back into one circuit, namely track power or the 12 volt supply, I needed something different to the terminal block connectors. Those connectors are essentially about connecting one cable to another, but I needed to connect lots of cables together. I took a two-fold approach to this. To minimize the number of overlapping cables and the number to join in one place, I've daisy-chained lots of them using the terminal block connectors. It's quite easy to link them together with a short cable. This effectively forms a small bus cable, and in the case of the point motor circuit meant I didn't need a multi-cable connector at all. After lots of looking around, I settled on these brass blocks. The term for them seems to be bus bar. These ones are designed to screw onto some plastic feet, but I've screwed them directly onto the door, since it's not conductive, which saves me height and surface area. These bars are by far the most compact way I could find of connecting lots of cables together without soldering. 
I do need to be a bit careful with them because they're not shielded. I've deliberately left the positive and negative parts of the 12 volt power supply a reasonable distance apart in order to avoid accidentally connecting them with something. To start with, I'd bought these terminal blocks. Other YouTubers have been quite keen on them, but they're quite expensive and take up a vast amount of space. I regret buying these. They're also quite heavy, which matters to me given that I have to carry the layout back and forth. I think I would even rather make a load of loops of wire to go along one side of these terminal blocks if I didn't have the bus bars, as it would be an awful lot more compact. One type of connector I'm particularly happy with are these spring-loaded ones. I was inspired by my old Hornby controller. It's very quick and easy to connect a cable to these, and it gets held firmly. These are ideal for connecting my controller to the layout each time I get it out. Believe it or not, my journey with cable connectors still wasn't complete. Next up were the point levers. Each lever needs two connectors back directly to the point that it controls, and one connection to the common. Given that the common is common to all of the levers, I only needed one of those coming out from the railway to the switches. Overall, for eight switches, that means I need 17 cables coming out from the layout which is why doing everything above board becomes a big pain. Moreover, as I didn't have space on the door to mount the switches directly, I'd need to be connecting and disconnecting those 17 each time I got the layout out. I left this element of the wiring until last, and so by the time I got to it I'd become much more comfortable and competent with electrics. I realised that so long as I got 17 wires of some sort going between the switches and the door, it would work, and so I cut up an old ethernet cable. The cable has eight inner cables, all shielded from each other so I used two sections of it to get the 16 switch connections back to the point motors and left the common as a loose cable. I bought these connection kits from Railway Scenics that allow me to easily connect and disconnect the cables. It came with a printout showing how to wire the connectors that are inside, which is a nice touch. I found it very rare to get guidance with electrical bits and pieces, so I was impressed with that. To connect cables to the point levers, I first bought a pack of Pico connectors from the same place as the levers, which was either Hatton's or Rails of Sheffield. These were good in as much as they work, and I know they'd be the right thing because that's what they're for. But actually, they're overpriced standard female spade ferrules. So once I knew that, I ordered the rest from Railway Scenics for a much lower price. Happily, these ferrules, once initially bent as directed with some pliers, do work with the standard crimping tool and form a tight connection onto the small cables. Having done all of this for the point switches, I'm considering replacing it with something called a 25-pin D sub-connector, because then I'll get them all in one connector and cable. On Railway Scenics, there's an option of a breakout board for various D sub-connectors, which gives screw terminals to connect the cables into. That looks a lot easier than soldering directly onto the D sub-connector. I can't actually remember why I didn't do this to start with, especially as I know I looked at these D sub-connectors. The last connections to talk about are the 12 volt DC supply for the LEDs and relays and the 16 volt AC supply for the point motors. As has frequently been my experience, I couldn't find detailed information, so I had to do some guesswork and experimentation. The round ends to these power plugs seem to be quite common. I've seen them on plenty of non railway things, and in fact, the plug I had for the LED power is actually from some LED strip lights for interior home decoration. The Railway Scenics website had these 2.1mm DC power adapter plug to screw terminal block connectors. There are also other types of connectors that mention DC power, and they were all 2.1mm as well, so I reasoned it was likely that 2.1mm is the standard size. These fit, and they have the positive and negative terminals marked, but it doesn't say which part of the socket either is connected to. I looked up information about the symbols for these plugs because it seems the polarity could be either way around. My plugs say the center is the positive, and wiring to the assumption that the connectors are the same, the LEDs work. If the polarity were the wrong way around, then the LEDs wouldn't light. I don't think there's any risk of damaging them, so experimentation is okay. It might be that it's very rare to have center negative, but I think you need a lot of pre-existing knowledge about electrics to be aware of undocumented conventions. I've recently contacted Railway Scenics about this, and to their credit, they intend to add this information. It's also worth saying at this stage that although it says it's for DC power supply, it's exactly the same as the AC plug that I got. A connector is just a connector. It can be for either DC or AC. As things stand with Endor, I've got a big loom of cables that need to cross the tracks. At the moment, I use this old piece of OL scale viaduct to carry them over, but ultimately I intend to have a tunnel over this area, so the cables will be buried in that. As I mentioned in my last video, I'm going to be experimenting with some alternative control components for the point motors, frog polarity and LEDs. I've now got something from the Rails Connect range from Rails of Sheffield, 
I haven't tried it yet, but I don't envisage needing to do any soldering for these experiments, thanks to my arrangement with the terminal block connectors. It makes me pleased I took this approach to the wiring. I'm a bit undecided about how the switches connect back there. The loom of cables is much bigger than I'd vaguely considered, so digital control might be the way to go, especially as the rails connect units can be controlled by DCC. I'm adamant that I want physical switches for the operator though, which could make going digital very expensive. In fact, I don't think the Gage Master Prodigy Express controller can control any accessories, so I might need a system upgrade too. That being the case, I'm unlikely to make any imminent changes. I'd like to see what the recently announced Gage Master Infinity series ends up looking like, both in terms of features and cost. That's all for this video. I haven't yet decided what the next one will be about, but as things stand at the moment, I've laid the outer loop of track much more successfully than the first loop. I've got experiments to do with the Rails Connect point control, and I've filmed a DCC decoder fitting to the DAPL A1 and DAPL A4, so it's likely to be one of those topics. Bye bye for now.